which is also another uh, literal translation that falls in line with the New American Standard as well as the ESV. But I want to steal my subject title from there because there in Nehemiah chapter 5 when, when the Levites came and they said, stand up, uh, the text in the Holy Christian Bible says, stand up, praise Yahweh your God, for everlasting to the everlasting. Praise your glorious name, and may it be exalted above all blessings and praise. You alone are Yahweh. You created them. You gave them life to all of them, and the heavenly hosts worship you. You are Yahweh. And the reason I like that particular translation and the way that it reads, because it, it emphasized Yahweh, the, the, the covenant-created name of God, over and above every single other God in all of the nations. So for a subject this morning, I want to I wanna preface this and, 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 and label it, stand up and praise the Lord. Because there's one thing that we really need to do. If, if we're going to look at this particular chapter, and even coming off the heels of Nehemiah chapter 8, if we really want to grasp what this chapter is communicating, then we really got to put ourselves in their shoes. We, we, really, we really want to try to feel what they felt. Because in these two chapters, there's a lot of emotions going on. Literally, the people of Israel, they're going through some things, if you will. We have to understand that they're coming off of a, a very festival time. Pastor Ray said only about 30 or 40 percent of y'all were, were smiling. But this was a joyous time for them. <laughs> Just think of where they at and, and refer back into your mind all of the sermons that have been preached. Because they came into a situation to where it seemed like there was no hope. It seemed as if the name of God had been defeated. They were defeated as a people. And yet now they stand in must of a wall that was torn down and broken down, and now the wall is built. They stand at a place now where, where God is seemingly giving them victory after victory because there was so much opposition that they had to overcome constantly at every turn, all to rebuild this city. They got all of this opposition, and God continued to deliver them. They even had, had the spat amongst themselves where there became some infighting amongst one another that caused the work to cease. And what did they do? They overcame that as well. God brought them through that again. And so now, after last week, you heard that they got the book of the law out. They done read the book. They found out they had not been celebrating the festivals as they should. They found out that they had not been joyful because of all that God had done for them. If you remember in Nehemiah chapter 8, verse number 10, our text said, Then he said to them, Go, eat, eat of the fat, drink of the sweet, and send portions to him who has nothing prepared. For this day is holy to our Lord. And he said, Don't be grieved. Don't, don't be somber. Don't, don't, don't have, have those faces that look like you can suck in lemons. Don't, don't have that face. But he said that the joy of the Lord, it is your strength. You ought to be joyful and excited because now you're standing in Jerusalem. It is no longer torn down. It is now built back up. Amen. You did not have the book of the law, but now you do. You ought to be rejoicing. The Day of Atonement, they had just celebrated. And now they're celebrating the, the, uh, the Feast of Tabernacles or Sukkot. That they're celebrating all these things. And he said, they should be joyful. New community, you, you ought to be more joyful as you come to this text. Amen. You ought to be more excited. Because the application here is this. If you will walk faithfully with your God, he will also deliver you. Amen. No matter what opposition you find yourself facing, God will give you deliverance. Amen. You should stand up and praise the Lord for all of the goodness on 
which is the day of the atonement, and they will realize, they will recognize that it's their sin that has put them in this situation. But they just now celebrated that. They just now realize that their sin has been atoned for and forgiven, and now they're back right with God. Ain't that enough alone to cause you to stand up and praise the Lord? Amen. Ezra is leading the Levites. He's telling them that they ought to be rejoicing. They ought to be happy. Because why? God is doing a great work in them. Now maybe if you can't feel that emotion and that excitement, maybe God's not doing something with you. Maybe you need your Day of Atonement. The Festival of Tabernacles. It was designed for a particular purpose and a particular reason. It was to bring them out of their comfort zones. See, when they, when they celebrated this particular festival, they, they had to come out of their plush living rooms back home, you know, where they had that, their carpet laid out. Okay, for them it was dirt. But just walk with me for a second. <laughs> but, but they had to come out of the comforts of their homes, and they had to make these little huts, and they had to stay there for a whole week. They didn't have the comfort. If it had rain, they, they didn't have their, their normal covering, their normal protection. All they were doing was sleeping in these huts. Why? Because God wanted them to remember. As a matter of fact, God told Moses, he said, look, Moses, put it in my vernacular. Let them know that the moment I deliver them and take them to the promised land, do not forget the Lord your God who delivered you out of the land of Egypt. And we're going to talk about that more. But don't forget all of the goodness and all of the blessings that I have gave you when you go into the land. And what did they do? They went into the land and they did just the opposite. They forgot. And so now they're being called back to this remembrance. They're being called back out of their comfort zone. And called to stand up and praise the Lord for all that he is doing. Maybe too many of you, comfort zone is too plush and too comfy. Maybe God has blessed you so much that you really need to stop and self-examine. Maybe you need to set up a tent and just live outside like the homeless for a week. And so you just realize just how good God has been to you. And realize this goodness that God has been to you is not because you yourself are good, but because he alone is good. Amen. This was a joyous feast, this feast of booth, to remind us, to wake us up, and to let us know that we cannot be self-reliant as believers. We cannot be selfish. We must give up the I mentality and begin to focus and think with a we mindset if we are going to advance the kingdom of God. Amen. We must turn from our idols. We must turn from our comforts of sin. We must repent. We must turn to our Redeemer who died on Calvary's cross that we might be redeemed, that our sins might be forgiven, that we will be set free from the bondage of sin that held us back. The, 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 the Christ on Calvary's cross gave us salvation. He gave us forgiveness. He cleansed us from all of our sins. He alone made all these things happen. And because he has done this, we as believers in the New Testament, we ought to stand up and just give God praise and be joyful and be excited for all that God done on Calvary's cross. Amen. We should be so excited. As I check the calendar, actually that, that feast is ending this evening. It's ending with a joyous occasion for those Jewish believers who, who were looking and recognized and believed their Messiah. That speech is ending, and ending it with a very, very time of joyful celebration. One of the things also about this festival, not only did it end where they praised God and they worshiped God for all of the provisions that he also had provided for them, but this was also a time that they would, they would pray.
pray and seek God's face that he would give rain. Okay? That they wanted rain so that their crops would grow. So they would have a fruitful season upcoming. Now, in a spiritual sense, there, there ought to be a rain that we're looking for. There, there, there ought to be a pouring out, if you will, of the Spirit of God to fall upon all flesh, to call women, men, boys, and girls to come and confess their sin. There ought to be a spiritual rain that we're looking for, that men might be cleansed from their sin and forgiven, and that gap that, that separated them from God can now be restored, that rain might fall from heaven and call men, women, boys, and girls to repent. That rain is that living water. That living water that in John chapter 7, as they celebrated this festival, Jesus said these words. He said, if any thirst, let him come to me and drink. And he who believes in me, as the scriptures have said, out of his heart flows the rivers of living water. Jesus acknowledged it. Remember, he told the woman at the well, he said, if you drink of this water here, you will never thirst again. That's the message of the gospel that we have to take out within our community and to tell those who are lost and those who are searching, those who can't look to Capitol Hill because of all the madness that's going on, those who can't look to their job because they're here one day and they're gone the next, those who can't rely on, our, on the health of America because America is on shaky ground itself, but they can draw from their living water the Lord Jesus Christ, and he said they will never thirst again. That's the message of the gospel that we take to all the world, every single person that we come in contact with. We tell them of this living water that we have drunk ourselves, and we tell them this is the reason why we stand and we praise the Lord. And living water. And living water ought to cause you to stand and praise the Lord. Also, too, right before we get to this text, God was working through them as Israelites. God was working through Nehemiah's leadership. God was working through Ezra and the Levite priests. He was working. We see God constantly working as we have come up through these eight chapters. And I hope that you remember why we began this book study in the first place. I hope you remember why we began on this journey. For, for as we were coming together, as we were merging con congregations, as we were becoming one, it was, it was said by Pastor Ray, this will be a good book for us to grow together and that we might build together and that we might become one. I hope you remember and understand that God is at work here at New Community. God is moving in ways that you even don't understand right now. God is preparing things uh, before you and ahead of you that you may not see today, but you have to know God is at work. And just like the Israelites in this book, they did not at times see that this wall was going to be completed. There were times when they were ready to give up, but they continued. They continued to press on. They continued to work. They continued to build. Nehemiah said, I cannot come down from this work because I'm doing a good thing. And they kept on working. And God gave them the victory. That's why Ezra can say, stand up and praise the Lord because of his goodness and because of his grace. In new community, you ought to stand up and give God praise. You ought to stand up and give him glory for all that he's doing now, for all that he has done, Amen. and for that which he is going to do through you. Amen. You ought to stand up and give God praise for what he is going to do. Nehemiah flows off the back of chapter 8 as we walk into chapter number 9. And as we began to look at this text, I figured I'd ask the question, why stand up and praise the Lord? Why? So as I was going through the chapter, three reasons came about as I began to study and as I began to read. Three reasons why we should stand up and praise the Lord. 
And that first point is taken from verses 1 through 6. That we should stand up and praise God because of the greatness of our God. We should stand up and praise God because of the greatness of our God. But then I ask this question. How do we see his greatness in this, this first section? Well, we begin by seeing God's greatness in the worship of his people. Notice this in that first chapter. And, and, and again, the feast, they have ended. It's the 24th day. They've come back together. They've assembled again. And they come together for worship. And if you follow this particular picture uh, here in these first few verses, you, you see all of the aspects of worship. You see that they are rejoicing. You see they're, they're grateful that God has given them a new beginning. They're grateful that the wall has been built. They've recovered the word of God so that they can read the word of God amongst the people of God. The Levites is leading them in prayer. These are all the elements and aspects of worship. You have a people that are here who are starting out afresh almost all over again. A people who have been battered and bruised. But they have now seen the balm of Gilead come into their lives and heal their wounded soul. Stop for a moment and just, stop for a moment and just think back through all, again, all of the sermons that you heard. All of the things that you, you, you we talked about Nehemiah and everyone doing. All of the favor of God that we've seen throughout these particular chapters. Through all these things, they have reason to stand up and give God praise. New community, you again, you do likewise have those very same reasons as they had. If we look closely, in spite of all of the challenges, look at the ministry that, that has been created here at New Community. In spite of all of the challenges, see how we go forth continually, being steadfast, being unmovable, uh, uh, continuing in the work of the Lord. See how God is doing all of these things. See how our gifts, remember Nehemiah chapter 3, see how our gifts are steadily being sharpened and steadily being used and we're growing up together as one body just like they were. Uh, new community, you, I hope that you will see all these things taking place before your eyes. Because of what if God has done, what if God is doing, and what God is going to do, we really, as, Neil, as uh, Ezra commanded here in this text, we should stand up and praise the Lord. Mm -hmm. These opening verses shows the greatness of God and give us reason to stand up because of the worship of their people. We see how they were assembled. See they're confessing their sins. And also, real worship is about not just those three key elements there. But real worship is also about separation. Because as we look at that text, in, in verse 1, we see that they assemble. In verse 2, you see that they confess their sins. And in verse 3, you see that the word of God has been opened. Now I want to draw to our attention uh, this particular question that I want to ask here. Has our time this morning, I'm going to be real practical, bring it home, drop it in your lap. Has our, has our time this morning of worship driven your hearts to know the need to fast and pray and confess your sins? Has our time this morning, as we have sung songs, as we have read the scriptures, has that uh, uh, caused you or driven you to you yourself to be in sackcloth and ashes, to be in, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a mindset of repentance before the, the Lord our God? Has our time this morning driven you to see your need to lay prostrate before the Lord our God? Or, 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 or in 2018, would you even dare lay out before God and say, woe is me that I am a man or woman of unclean lips? Will, will you say that before your God as you prepare and participate in worship? 
Or do you think that you just have a right to come in here? You have a right to sing the song. You have a right to read the scripture. You have a right to do all that we normally, typically, and sometimes even routinely do. Do you somehow believe that you just have that right? Or do you see the great need for us to recognize that in spite of my weak, yeah. in spite of my fault, and in spite of my failures, he calls unto me and says, come unto me. All you are weary and heavy laden. And he says, I will give you rest. That ought to cause you to want to stand up and praise him. Every other religion, every other cult, they all say if you're going to come back to God and you're going to get right with God, you got to do something. You got to perform some type of work. You got to put in some hours of service. You got to say these uh, Pacific Five prayers. You got to do all these things. You got to sit down and, and meditate. All these rituals that you yourself have to go through to simply work your way back into a right relationship with God. When our God, Yahweh, what he says for us to do is to <laughs> repent of your sins. Turn from your ungodliness. Believe in my son who I sent to die for your sins. He laid his life down on Calvary's cross that you might be reconciled back to me. Believe that and stand up and rejoice and give him glory for all that he has done. God's greatness is seen in worship of his people. God's greatness is also seen in the separation of his people. You see that uh, in verse in verse 2 it said they separated themselves from all the foreigners. Why, why is that important? Why did that have to be included? The Bible clearly said evil communication does what? It corrupts good matters. So here, here they are in their mindset that if we're going to get right back with God, if we want to celebrate Yom Kippur the way that it ought to be celebrated, if we're going to celebrate the Feast of Tabernacles the way it ought to be celebrated, we've got to separate ourselves. Amen. If we're going to be real with God. Hmm. Warren Wishby said this, separation without devotion to the Lord becomes simple isolation. But devotion without separation, that's hypocrisy. Hmm. We can't be hypocrites have real worship. Mm. 2 Corinthians chapter 6 says this, that not to, uh, and, and, and I told uh, Pastor Ray's favorite version, the, the NLT, but it says this, 2 Corinthians chapter 6, uh, don't team up with those who are unbelievers. How can righteousness be a partner with wickedness? How can light live with darkness? What harmony can there be between Christ and the devil? How can a believer partner with an unbeliever? And what union can there be between God's temple and the temple of idols? For we are the living temple of God. How can there be? <coughs> Second Corinthians chapter 7 says this. Because we have these promises from God, dear friends, let us cleanse ourselves from everything that can defile our body or spirit. And let us work toward complete holiness with fear to our God. That's what they see. That's how we ought to feel. We, we have to separate ourselves from those ungodly features and factors that plague our lives. Those things that so easily beset us and hinder us in our run away, our run in our race. If we are going to truly worship the Lord our God, and if we're going to give him true praise and worship, then we must separate ourselves from those ungodly things. So God's greatness is not just seen in the worship of his people or in the separation of his people, but God's greatness is also seen in the power of his creation. Did, did, did you see the text that they talked about as they went into it? Look here at, at verse 6. He says, you alone are the Lord. You have made yeah. the heavens. Yeah. He said, you made the earth and all that's in it. Yeah. He said, you even made the sea, everything in them. Yeah. He said, you give life yeah. to all of them. The angels of the heavenly host, they bow down and worship you because of your great power to create. God's greatness is seen as his power to creation. All of creation has been made by the very fingertips of God. 
some praise. There ought to be just some time that people ought to look at you really, really weird because you just got to stop and say, God, you've been so good. Amen. Glory. We ought to stand up and give God praise because of his greatness. Not just because of his greatness, but also we need to stand up and give God praise because of his goodness. So as we look at um, verses 7 through 30, the goodness of God is seen in three ways here. I'm going to try to work through this as fast as I can. But the goodness of God is seen in three ways. Number one, it's seen in his design people. And here's what I mean by this. If you look back to Genesis chapter 10, the table of nations, you got all these people, you got all this stuff going on, and you see Genesis 11, and you see the coming of Abram and his family uh, from where they were and where they were coming. And God didn't just, he, he, he didn't just, um, how do I want to say it? He, he didn't just uh, use the people groups that were already there. But he said, no, I want to start a new people. I'm going to design this group of people that they will worship me and they will worship me alone. So what did he do? As we look through this in, in verse number seven, you see the first person that's mentioned about how God chose Abram. Remember, his father, Terran, all, all the families were there. All the people were there. They were traveling and they were caring for one another. And they were also worshiping the pagan gods of earth and over in Mesopotamia. They were doing all those things. And God reaches down and he chooses Abram amongst them all. And he said, if you follow me, I'll give you a land. If you follow me, I'll make you the father of many nations. If you follow me, I'll bless you so that every nation on the planet of earth will be blessed because of you if you follow me. Abraham had reason to stand up and praise the Lord because of what he'd done. But then just think about you. If he chose Abram, and that's what the text said. I didn't say that. He said, who chose Abram? Likewise with you. Whatever your salvation story is, he chose you. If you're anything like me, he would have to choose you. <laughs> Amen. S serving God was the, the furthest thing yeah. from my mind and my heart. Amen. Giving up a, a Sunday when, when my team playing, when, when the Cowboys about to beat down the Falcons, I would never give that up. <laughs> but I would never give up an NFL Day Sunday. I made sure that I was sitting there to watch NFL Today and whatever that other show is. Right. And I caught the 1 o'clock game. I caught the 4 o'clock game. I watched the prime time game. I was all in. But when God called me yeah. out of darkness into his marvelous light, I can't do nothing but stand up. Amen. So not only did he, did he look at Abraham there and the design of his people, but he also talked about how his people were in bondage in Egypt. In verses uh, 9 through 14. And God said, I delivered my people. I designed them to be a people who would know that I would deliver them and that I would set them free. And so he designed his, his people. He cared for his people. He gave them signs and wonders. And while they were under the hand of the oppression of Pharaoh, he set his people free. As God's people, as they said in my affectionate way, as they toured the wilderness and enjoyed the scenery, God's goodness was seen again. And again, you have to read those verses, 15 to 16. But you see God giving them food to eat. You see God giving them water to drink. And you see God giving them and so that they can go and they can possess the land that he swore that he would give to them. And if that wasn't good enough, you see God's goodness expressed by the direction that he gives his people in verses 19 through 22. And again, for 40 years, that 40-year journey through the wilderness, God never forsook his people that he had made covenant with. We see this. We see this constant idea that God's 
goodness is seen both in the design of his people and the direction of his people. But also, we have to see it in the, the, the goodness of, uh, we have to see it in the discipline of his people. Because regardless of all that God has gave them, regardless of all that they did, they still forgot. And if you read, read, read this on your time and read it slowly, because you see God being such a giver to them, they should have understood and recognized God's goodness. And let me highlight real quick before we deal with that last point of the discipline, so you can see why they needed to be disciplined. Okay. If you walk through this quick, I'm going to just throw this out there. you got to read it yourself. But in verse 8, it says about God that he gave them the land of the Canaanites. And then verse 13 says that God gave them ordinances and laws, statutes, and commandments. Verse 15 said that he says that you provided bread or you gave bread from heaven. From heaven you gave bread when they were hungry. You brought forth water from a rock or you gave it. This ideal of forgiveness is found scattered all through this particular chapter. Verse 20, you gave your good spirit to instruct them and give them manna. You gave, you gave them water for their thirst. Verse 22, you also gave them kingdom and peoples. Verse, verse 24, you gave them into the land with their kings and, and the peoples of the land to do with them as they desire to do. That's a factor real quick. That's a factor that's sometimes left out of Christianity. God has given us this world to do what we, what we desire to do. If you were, should have been sitting in Sunday school. But if you weren't, you heard Jason talk, talk about that, talk about the Westminster Confession, that we are to enjoy, enjoy God. Rejoice in him forever. That is the chief end of man, to do just that, to enjoy the Lord, our God. And he said to them, hey, he gave them this, gave them, uh, this land that they can do that way they desire with them, with it. Also, verse 27, he said, you delivered, you gave them victory into their hands from their oppressors. You gave them deliverance. So often, all the way through this particular chapter, you see this. One might ask the question if God has done so much good for these people, why the discipline? Why the chastisement? If God had been so good, wouldn't, wouldn't his goodness be reciprocated back to him? That's the logical thing. And even before I look at this particular verse, recognize that that's the logical thing. Let us not be so comfortable. Let us not get into the position that we might look at them and say, they should have seen all of this goodness. They should have seen the signs, the wonders, and the miracles. They, sh they should have seen getting up every morning and there again is manna again. They should have seen it and they should have reciprocated goodness back into their God. What were they thinking about? What was wrong with them? Before you chastise them and what they failed to do, understand and recognize every single morning that you rise up from your bed and you jump into your shoes and you go off to work or you go off to school or you go off to do the daily routines of your life that you ought to stop and praise God lest you be like them. Amen. Lest you fall into your own comfort. Let, lest you jump up and leave your house, jump in your nice car, crank it up and ride on into the sunset. All these blessings and all these things that God has gave you, you might want to stop before you open your car door and say, God, I thank you. I ain't got to walk. God, I thank you. I can look back. I got a roof over my head. God, I thank you. I'm leaving this morning with a belly full of food. God, I thank you. You have just been so good to me. Therefore, because of that, I stand up and I have to give God praise. Amen. These people, yet they had to be disciplined, though. Sadly, sadly, they had to be disciplined. If you look at verse 6, 16, excuse me, look at verse 16, it says of them that our fathers, how did they act? They acted arrogantly. They became stubborn. And they would not listen to the commandments of God. Verse 17 said they refused to listen and did not remember the wondrous deeds which you have performed among them. Probably referencing the Red Sea. You refused. You became stubborn. But look at the goodness of God. You are God, though. You are a God of forgiveness. You're a God.
not gracious and compassionate. You are slow to anger and abounding in loving kindness. And amidst all that they had done, it said right there in verse 17 that God, you did not forsake them in their rebellious heart. Oh, I'm so glad for the great compassion and the mercy that God had. So when I fall into that same stupor, I know that all I need to do is repent and return unto the Lord our God. He will Amen. not forsake you. Amen. They said, of God, you are great and compassionate. Yes. And they said about themselves, not just about their fathers, but they recognized their own sin. Do not forsake us as well. Amen. And he didn't. And that didn't happen but once, but as this prayer continued, if you look at verse 25 there real quick, it said that they captured fortified cities and a fertile land. They took possession of the houses and all those good things. They had hewn systems, they had vineyards, they had olive groves, they had fruit trees in abundance. They ate, they were filled, and the text here said that they grew fat. That's how good they were doing. Amen. They were balling, if you will. <laughs> it said that there, it was revealed about the great goodness of God. But then, what happened? Verse 26, they became disobedient. In the midst of their goodness, in the midst of their fatness, they became disobedient. They rebelled against you, and they cast their law. This has got to be disrespectful. They cast God's law behind their back. And when we lived out on their own selfishness, mm -hmm. again, if we're not careful, we will do the exact same thing mm -hmm. to God. We'll take his word and it'll accumulate dust mm -hmm. from Monday to Sunday morning. Mm -hmm. and we have to clean it off mm -hmm. before we come to church, if we bring it because we, we, we got it all on our, our cell phone. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Where does the word of God, its importance, importance rely on? Your life. Mm -hmm. It was interesting. The old saying, "How it goes, if you if you fool me once, uh, shame on you. Something like that. If you fool me twice, shame on me, or, or vice versa." I thought about that because I looked at verse twenty-eight as I was reading through here, mm -hmm. and it talked about how God gave them deliverance and God delivered them from their oppressions and all that type of stuff in the previous verse. Then in verse twenty-eight, it goes again and says, "As soon, look at that. As soon." As they had rest, they did evil again before you, God. Again, if we are not careful, if, if we, matter of fact, if we get this text and we understand it and we leave here this morning, if we are not walking out in repentance, if we are not walking out recognizing that in light of whatever my situation is or my circumstance is, i got to stand up and give God praise because he has been so good to me. Man. God's goodness has been expressed in this chapter by the designing of his people, calling them out of darkness into his marvelous light, and how he gave direction to his people, and even how he had to discipline his people because they grew fat in his goodness and they <laughs> failed to remember him. The Israelites were a very fickle people. Mm -hmm. Do me a Does that fickleness fit you? Will you stand up and give God praise for his goodness to you and his faithfulness to you and his mercy to you? So not just do we see the greatness of God, not just do we see the goodness of God, but we also see, we see the mercy and the grace of God of God. Look at how we see the grace of God here as we're down to verse 31. God was so good to his people, but they were not in return. God was so merciful and God was so forgiving. God was so long-suffering to his covenant people, and yet they rebelled against him and his word. God could have easily, easily destroyed them and started off fresh. He could have started all over again. If you haven't got a reason to stand up and give God praise before now, look at verse 31. <laughs> verse 31 
1 says, Nevertheless, in your great compassion, you did not make an end of them. God could have made an end of them with one simple thing on snap and wiped them all out. Not half the population. He could have snapped his fingers and wiped them all out. But the text said, in your great compassion, you did not make an end of them. You did not forsake them. You are a gracious and compassionate God. That there alone ought to be reason for you to stand up and praise the Lord. Verse 32, now therefore our God, they called him the great and the mighty and the awesome God who keeps covenant and loving kindness. They say to him, do not let all those hardships seem insignificant before you, which has come upon us. They talk about how it came upon the kings and all of them. For the days of the kings of Assyria. Verse 33, however you are just in all that has come upon us. For you have dwelt faithfully, but we, we have acted wickedly. Our kings and our leaders, our priests, our fathers have not kept your law. They did not pay attention to your commandments. And your abominations with, uh, which you have admonished them. And then verse 35 says this. They in their own kingdom, with your great goodness, which you gave them, with a broad and rich land, which you set before them, they still did not serve you, or they did not turn from their evil deeds. And in their abundance, and because of their sin, they're recognizing all these things, and they're calling out to God in prayer, led by Ezra and the Levites, for the grace of God. Have you stopped and said, yeah, God, I can see the very fact that you could end it all, but because of your grace, and God's great compassion, and God's great mercy, and in God's great goodness, his grace is seen and set on display about the character of God, about why we, when we gather in this place, our hearts are, are to be filled with flames of fire of the Holy Ghost that we might worship the Lord our God. That we might stand up and give Yahweh all the praise because of his grace. That we might stand up and cry aloud that we recognize all that you could do, but the fact that you didn't do it. The fact that you did make right with us. The fact that you made right what we could never have made right. You ought to stand up and give God praise for his grace. Praise for his mercy. And praise for his loving kindness. I want to end with this statement from Warren Wispy. He says, our God is a glorious God. He is powerful, he is faithful, and he is concerned about the needs of his people. He is, part, he, he is a pardoning God who is long-suffering when we sin, but chastens us if we rebel. He is a generous God who gives us far more than we deserve. He is a God who keeps his promises even when we are unfaithful. He is faithful. You ought to stand up and give God praise because of his faithfulness. You ought to stand up and give God praise for the faithfulness that he has shown to New Community Baptist Church over all these years. You ought to stand up and just simply rejoice and give God praise, glory, and honor for all that he's doing, for all that he's
because he made covenant with you through the blood of Calvary's cross. And we have to take that message to all of the world and tell men, women, boys and girls, no matter how you have sinned, if you come unto the cross, if you come unto Jesus, he will forgive you of your sin and cleanse you from all unrighteousness and set you free 